The following extract is from a contemporary account describing events leading up to D-Day called The Big Five from the US Army Transportation Journal. It was written in May 1945 by Staff Sergeant George Pellett. Southampton was seen as the Allied anchor at the end of four other great continental ports, Cherbourg, Le Havre, Rouen and Antwerp. The description is written in the present tense before the war was finally over and provides a useful insight into the Allied supply ports. Without the five big channel ports providing the transportation corps with short route gateways to the European continent, our armies probably would still be fighting north of the Seine or pushing their spearheads across the Belgian border. Without Cherbourg, Le Havre, Rouen and Antwerp, many of the weapons of victory perhaps would still be dispersed over the English countryside and awaiting shipment on the docks at Southampton. But the big five are ours, feeding tanks and food and gasoline and soldiers to the Allied armies. Each port in itself a unique story of total war, ruin, courage and hard work. Long before D-Day, the huge blitz battered British port of Southampton, jumping off point for the Allied invasion forces, had become a veritable anthill of activity beneath one of the finest camouflage jobs of the war. The 14th port had been charged with a great many delicate and hazardous projects in preparation for the invasion. Working in close cooperation with British and American headquarters, the port was occupied with preloading material, handling and storing prefabricated harbours, preparing block ships, practice manoeuvres, anti-aircraft defence plans and countless other activities. When the crucial day arrived, all was quiet in Southampton Harbour. Preloaded forces and materiel sailed swiftly from secluded inlets and openly exposed concentration points in the channel towards the French beaches. On D plus one, Southampton again became the scene of intense activity. The town's people awoke to find their city jammed with thundering convoys of tanks and trucks. Columns of marching troops wound down the hillsides toward the hards. Huge field kitchens set up at strategic points about the city fed thousands at each meal. The doggedly patient British turned to each other in serious elation. This is it, they glanced skywards. Surely the long idle Luftwaffe would strike. Here was certainly the time and the place. The fact that the Luftwaffe failed to appear is still one of the mysteries of the war. When the fall of Cherbourg was announced, badly needed railway rolling stock was put aboard LST specially fitted by the railway operating battalions. Supplementing the LSTs were sea trains and ferries that used to carry sleepers between Dover and Calais. During the first three months of the invasion, Southampton handled a large percentage of the rail rolling stock shipped from the United Kingdom, most of which found its way into France via Cherbourg. During this period, over 6,000 pieces of assorted equipment were loaded by the 14th port and towed across the channel on huge steel barges. In November, Southampton handled thousands of tons in addition to huge troop operations. Today, Southampton's sea lanes to the continental ports are filled with the traffic of war. While experts ponder the problem of logistics involved in the post-victory move toward Japan's crumbling empire, the channel ports continue to build up our armies, poised for the final drive. Cherbourg, Le Havre, Rouen, Antwerp and Southampton will all play new roles when the job is finished and the exodus from continental Europe begins. Meantime, they continue working 24 hours a day with their floodlights glaring brazenly into the night. Germany's fate was sealed when the first ship sailed into Cherbourg. The big five are now camped on Hitler's doorstep and the biggest of the five, Antwerp, is banging loudly on the door. A plaque was unveiled at the dock gates. 1939 to 1945. This tablet was presented to the Southern Railway by the 14th Major Port United States Army in proud and glorious memory of the men and women of the forces of the United Nations who sailed from this port during the war against aggression to secure the freedom of mankind.
Now Southampton is returning to normal activity. She might take a well-earned rest, but that would not be in the dock's tradition. Ships, once familiar at her keys, are now carrying passengers and merchandise again. Southampton is still Britain's premier passenger port, prepared to receive any ship and every ship. This is the wartime saga of Southampton Docks. <laughs>